About three years ago, I was sitting in front of my computer one miserably hot Los Angeles afternoon working on my stand-up comedy act. And I had grown so bored with stand-up comedy by this time, and specifically with my act. <laughs> and I got to daydreaming, and for some reason I thought of this thing that my crazy brother Mike had said to me nearly 30 years before. Only the truth is funny. And I think it's obvious that that is not literally true. Look at the far side. <laughs> but I think the far side is so hysterical because it does something with the truth. It takes the truth into account, which I had never done in my act. And I decided, what would happen? What would happen if I took the lies out of my act? All of the, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the club. Oh, I just broke up with my girlfriend. And so I took everything not true out of my act, and I had no act. I had nothing left. <laughs> the hardest bit for me to let go of was this thing I loved about my grandfather, who was paralyzed from the neck up. You know, he was, and it's tragic, because he was a lounge singer at the time. If you think about it, who's going to pay good money to see... <laughs> For some reason, after nine years of being funny every night, trying to make drunk people burst out laughing in bars, it wasn't fun anymore. It didn't seem important. I don't know. I lost the magic of it. So I gave it up, and we moved to Petaluma, and I started to piece together the puzzle of my life, which became this show. And I started to acquire what I naively call the ingredients of happiness, living in the moment appreciating the little things in my life, being in love with somebody who loved me back and trying to be my notion of a good person. And these things made me happier, but not happy enough. I still had a very Peggy Lee-esque sensation. <laughs> Have you never looked at your life and asked, is that all there is? I mean, it seems a little thin sometimes, doesn't it? And then two years ago, I got the call, the call I had dreaded my entire life. My wife is at her doctor's, and she's calling to tell me that she's pregnant. Are you sure? <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's a good thing, honey. I'm just I'm trying to get used to it. Of course I'm happy. Hope it's a girl. Hope she looks just like you. Come on home, honey. We've got to celebrate. This is great. Good news. Real good news. Bye-bye. Fuck! <laughs> We're going to have a baby, a crying, pooping shackle around our ankles <laughs> the rest of our lives. I don't want that kind of responsibility. I don't want to be a father. I do not have a father I can look up to and emulate. I did not have a good childhood. I don't even like children. This is a mistake. And I'll tell you, I made a lot of mistakes during Lisa's pregnancy. The biggest was the day I told her I didn't need to be with her in the delivery room politically a very bad move <laughs> she shot me one of those looks of death and I went kidding <laughs> we started taking Lamaz class I hated Lamaz with such a passion because it was disgustingly cute the first night all of the men had to stand up and give a speech about why they were there and I'm ready to bolt at any second I can't stand this and finally they come to me Mr. Reynolds why are you here tonight so I stand up and I go I'm here tonight to help my beautiful wife, Lisa, and to share in this glorious moment. <laughs> and I'll tell you the truth, I didn't think it would be a glorious moment. I thought it would be like a car accident. <laughs> you ever been in a, a pretty bad car accident? You get out and you hover above the reality of that humongous moment? I thought it would be that. I thought Lisa would be in a great deal of pain, and I did not want to be there. Well... On January 6th of last year, three weeks before Cooper was due, way before we were ready for him, we're sitting watching TV one afternoon. Lisa gets up very nonchalantly, goes into the bathroom. She comes back and she says, there's water coming out of me. <laughs> so I looked at her and said, pee? 
you, but I thought when your water broke, it was obvious. It just came out. No, it's trickling, she tells me. So I call the doctor. It's trickling, I tell him. And he says, that's very common. Keep a surprise. So every hour on the hour for the next four hours, I called and I said, trickling, trickle, 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 trickle. And he says, this is it. You're having your baby come to the hospital. So I went to the hospital that day, Sunday. Cooper was born on Tuesday. It was not the perfect birth that we had hoped for. After 24 hours of being there, the water had in fact broken, but there was no labor. So they had to hook Lisa up to an IV of this Pitocin stuff. For the next 12 hours or so, we trudge up and down this long corridor. Lisa's pushing her IV. I'm walking beside her eating these vanilla puddings. Twelve of them I had. They're in the fridge. Take them. They're free. Twelve vanilla puddings, and they never appeared on the bill. To me, that's the miracle of birth right there. <laughs> I'm eating. They're delicious. Well, when labor finally kicked in, I understood why we had taken Lamaze class. Pain. A great deal of pain. I hated this pain because it was happening to my wife and because it was a mystery to me. I could not relate to it. It's an intense woman cramping thing. It would have been so much easier on me if I understood the pain. If every 30 seconds somebody had snuck in the room and whacked her in the head with a big stick, <laughs> that would be better. <laughs> breathe, honey, breathe. Here comes that damn stick. Whack, whack, whack. That must hurt. Come on, breathe again. You can do it. Well, 52 hours after checking into this hospital, we are having a baby. Lisa is fully dilated. There's a doctor and a nurse. Shelly, our neighbor, is on one side of Lisa. I'm on the other, hand under her back, hand under her leg. Every contraction, she'd hold her breath and push, and we'd squeeze her together like an accordion, like this. And after an hour of intense pushing, Cooper began his entrance into the world. He started to crown, which is a nice way of saying that the ugly blue veiny tip of his head was sticking out. <laughs> the next thing that happened was very much like a scene from Alien. His head shoots out. Ah! <laughs> the scariest thing I have ever seen in my life. And I'm still pissed. Five Lamaze classes. They never once said, head shoots out. <laughs> How hard would it have been to have taken that doll and went, ah, like that? <laughs> so I'm sitting there. I'm looking at this, the crown thing, right? And then his head shoots out and I scream in front of all these people. And I'm already trying to figure out who he looks like. And I hope nobody, because he's damn ugly at this point. <laughs> and about a minute later came the actual birth, which sounds very much like this. <laughs> That's it, it just comes out. <laughs> and boy, this is a proud moment for me. Here's my son, a tiny little old man covered with goo. <laughs> and you know, they had asked me if I wanted to cut the cord. Who says no? I'm not touching that damn cord. <laughs> But I was not going to bite it, which some people do, just a clean cut and I'm done. And they took that turkey baster and cleared his mouth out and they, they fixed him up. And they put him up on Lisa's stomach. And he's quite young at this point, about three, four minutes old. And I walked up to him, he's little, he's red. And I go, hey, Cooper. Hey. Hey, Cooper. And I put my hand out and my little finger touched his hand. And he reached up and he grabbed my little finger and he squeezed so hard. And I started to tear up. And I looked at his hand, and I swear to you, I knew it was my son. There was my hand. A little teeny Ricky hand. No wedding ring, but everything else the same. <laughs> and I totally lost it in front of all of these strangers when they scooted Cooper up on Lisa's chest. And his mouth, the cutest mouth that has ever existed, fuck you if you don't believe me, <laughs> is already groping for her nipple. And it is what the word precious was invented to describe. And I just lost it. I sat down on this chair and started crying. Lisa never cried once. It's amazing to me. It's amazing. At the end, she was actually taking notes in this damn journal of hers. Ricky's crying. I'll jot that down. That's interesting. <laughs> she asked if she could feel the placenta. Fascinating. Made a note there. <laughs> My son Cooper is 16 months old now. 
He is so cute. You need special glasses to look at him, really. <laughs> You cannot describe it, can you? You cannot describe it. I hold him, I kiss his cheeks, I, I plug into him in some primal way. It is the best thing there is. And I am so amazed that this is Rick Reynolds saying this. God, I didn't want to have kids. I didn't think I could feel this emotion because of the childhood I had. But given the childhood I had, I should have kids. I saw it done wrong. I want to do it right. I want to tell my son I love him every day of his life. And I'll tell you, I have changed so much in 16 months. It used to gag me the way people talk to their babies, you know. <laughs> Who made a poo-poo pee-pee? <laughs> That's a pretty stinky poo-poo today. <laughs> this is me now. <laughs> it is. Cooper is never Cooper in our house. He's the Cooper Pooper man. <laughs> He doesn't go to sleep at night, he goes to CP Seepers. I make myself sick. <laughs> also, if you don't have kids, you must feel that cocky sense of freedom that I felt. You know, don't you kind of feel, what is it? I can get a slice of pizza at three in the morning. I can sell all my shit and move to Montana. I'm free. That's not the way it works. I can't tell you how much I look forward to driving home tonight. And I'll go into Cooper's room and I'll look at him. And he always lays just like this, like he's in the chalk outline of a dead guy. You know? <laughs> and it's the best. It is the best. Who would have believed that responsibility was a necessary ingredient of happiness? Why didn't you tell me that before? I have spent my entire life avoiding the thing I most needed. And the weird thing is, it sounds like nonsense until you're there. If you would approach me two years ago and said, Rick, you know why you're not really happy right now in life? You need more responsibility. I would have said, good point, all right, really good, good point. God. You know what the really hard thing about this show is? I get to these points where I have to say things that are like big truths about life. And they sound trite. And I know why they sound trite. Because they are. Everything has been said before. Having a baby puts your life into perspective. You've heard it before. You know it on your own, but it is a new truth to me. Cooper's birth has taught me so much about my life. And really, I think even more about my death the thing I have feared for so long. I think now that I have to die. Not just to make way for Cooper's generation, it is so much more than that. I think that my death gives my life scope and meaning and definition. I mean this literally. If we were not cognizant of the fact that we would one day die, we would never be happy for an instant of our lives. Why is time precious? One reason, because it's limited. This is the way things have to be. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't diminish my fear of death. It's so spooky that I'm not going to be around someday. It's a spooky notion. And when I am honest with myself, I admit that I fear life itself. Well, you know what? I think that's why God and humor were invented in the first place. You know, it really does seem to me now that at birth... We're rescued from a dark, silent place and ushered into a world full of wonder. Childhood is a magical time, free from responsibility. Hell, we're curious and filled with energy as teenagers and then challenged to reach our full potential as we become adults. In midlife, we watch as our pretensions slowly slip away, our dreams for happiness finally becoming realized. Old age brings wisdom wonderful memories, and a passionate love of life. Good night.